Yeah, turning to football on the Sportsbank Zone, the MLS has long been a route which many Caribbean natives have taken to play top-level football with several success stories emerging throughout the years. Many of those players tore through American collegiate scene and were selected via the MLS Super Draft with names such as Darren Mattox, who was selected second overall in 2012, and Andre Blake, who was selected first overall in 2014, being standouts. Over the past few seasons, Jamaica has produced more prodigious talents who have taken that same route with Justin McCaster being drafted 17th overall in 2021. Our guest today, who recently was drafted at 16th by Rail Salt Lake, a team which has a rich history of Jamaican players. You might have guessed it already. You probably have with us in studios, Jamaica's latest MLF draftee, Matthew Bell, and a man that helped guide him along his journey, technical director of a Kingston Football Academy, Eric Radamakas. A gentleman, it's a pleasure to have you on the Sportsmax Zone. Of course, Eric, you are no stranger to this stage. Well, maybe this studio, but not the Sportsmax stage. So it's a pleasure to have you back. And Matthew, it's a pleasure to have you on the show as well. Um, let me start with you, Matthew, because I want to get an understanding of your journey to this stage. Track that for me. What, what has that looked like? Well, um, I went to Kingston College. I played uh, Pepsi Colts Manning Cup. And then um, after that, there was a COVID period where there was nothing going on. And I started training with Coach Eric at uh, Kingston Football Academy. And then I got an invitation to play in America, in Boston, at Vallejo FC. And uh, I went to a prep school over there called South Kent Soccer. And um, that's when Marshall saw me, my university, and I played two seasons there and got drafted. Yeah, tell me about your time at Kingston College and what that was like in terms of your football development. So um, I was always around players who were faster than me, and um, coaches would prefer using the faster players up, up front. And um, I had to rely on my technical ability and my mental side of the game, thinking quickly. And uh, I think that's what gives me the edge when I develop that speed later on in my life. And um, that gives me the edge among a lot of players and just thinking quickly and having that pace as well, you know, it's a really big thing. Yeah, was that a diplomatic way of saying you were not a starter at Kingston no, College? No, and, and, and but you... I, mean, I think it's known, really, I wasn't really playing that much at KC. And, you know, it's helped me. You know, I wouldn't change anything in, in the steps that I've taken. Yeah. And it's really pushed me to prove to myself that, you know, I think I'm good enough and I think I was good enough back then, but just showing that, you know, maybe I should have played, but I'm grateful for everyone who's helped me and that certainly helped me become where I am today. Yeah, important that you, you made that point because I was just about to ask you, in the moments, being at Kingston College, not get, getting as much game time as you probably felt your talent deserved, what was it like then? So it was, it was hard for sure. Um, I always believed in myself and um, even last night I was with one of my friends who told me four years ago that someone on the team was who was starting over me, that he was better than me and I told him I'm going to prove you wrong and I'm going to remember this and last night I brought it up because I saw him again and you know I never forget those stuff, I never forget stuff like that. I think it's, it's motivation that you know everyone could use and if you take it positively and you put in the work and you know good things will happen yeah eric what did you see in him um i mean it was um as you mentioned uh, at case he was a little bit rough and um uh, ashton blankson who, who i work always very close with that uh, as um uh, partly director of the academy he said i have to watch matthew because i think it was against calabar um pre-season oh game uh, and we went to to watch over there over barbican field and um, I mean, so lively, you know, from the start to see like this guy just runs for every ball. And when he runs, there's so much explosiveness in it. Um, and both of us were like, what? you know, why I don't really play too much more and, and, and those things. Well, usually, as I say, when players don't have um, the, the game time, they might get motivation from that. And it's definitely something that we saw that that, that drive, as I say, I'm always believing in himself. And um, I think it's, um, it's great to see that um, he didn't give up. And, and go down with it and say there's new opportunities that come and he took them when, when, they, when they got in front of him. Yeah, Eric, you know, I wanted you to express something that 
I think is lost on a lot of football fans because whenever I hear recruits talk about what they look for in a player, quite often some of the things they talk about aren't the things that the average fan looks for. So we will see a player with a lot of ball handling skills and they look impressive and so on. And when you hear a recruit talking about the things that they look for, like leadership and attitude, there's a little bit of a difference in, 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 in what you know, yeah. these international recruits look um, for. Definitely, but when you start talking more to scouts and a person who have the eye for it, you start to realize, I was, I was just um, having a conversation with an international scout and he was mentioning a lot about longevity and their motivation. So the earlier you can recognize that somebody's motivation is not linked to a certain incident, but he has that all the way, he said the percentage that, that, uh, that he will make it goes up tremendously. Um, having that said, the first thing is you have to see a certain talent and a certain gift, that, that natural ability. But yeah. I think when scouts talk more about those things, you reach the stage that you already recognized all of the guys on our list yeah. have a certain amount of talent. Yes. So now we're going to look at those other things that, um, that make it a lot more likely to, to, to deal with it. Yes. Um, as I just mentioned, it, a joke four years ago, a guy didn't want to get it back, but there's a certain drive that shows in those things that I think is needed if you really want to deal with the pressure at a higher level. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's difficult to train, so you have to look for characteristics in a person uh, that makes you assume when there's 50,000 people shouting at him, can you still stay focused? And uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's a game that they're playing, but uh, you know, as they say, it's up to the players to say, put their, their teeth in it and say, I'm going to show him. Yeah. All right, Matthew, talk to us about the quality of football that you're exposed to in the USA because globally people don't have high regard for US football even though you know if you look at US football they are very organized mm -hmm. and um, in my estimation quite often underestimated um, the collegiate level in the US um, give me your assessment of it having played in it and also your expectation for MLS because MLS has grown I think exponentially in the past decade and a half from where it was in the mid 90s when it really took off so collegiate first and then talk to us about embracing an MLS opportunity so I think overall the whole game in the US is just fast-paced team a team game and that's kind of the big difference with hair and in the US hair is more individual you rely on one or two players to just do some magic over there it's tactical it's Everyone has a job, everyone's dedicated to doing their job, and it's just uh, very stamina-based as well. Pressing hard for 90 minutes, you know, and um, in the MLS, I think I'm expecting the same, honestly, because those are the type of players that they look for in college. So I'm just expecting, and with a lot of internationals coming in, like bigger names, Messi, Suarez, um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting until it gets a bit, like, more individualistic, but right now I know that it's just like, fast pace, you know, very stamina wise, and um, that's just what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's interesting that you say that because earlier you spoke about your time at Kingston College and how the coaches would go for the faster players, um, whereas you were a different type of player. Do you think the US system and the way they play and the team type of football has um, assisted significantly in your success because of the style? Yeah, I think um, what, one thing that we use, we rely on here is fast pace and that's how most players get to a high level. But um, you have to start thinking the game mentally. You have to start thinking tactically as well. It's just coaches give instructions and if you can't follow the instructions, they'll find someone else in, in your spot. And um, I think that's the difference. Yeah, um, Eric, can you make a quick comment to advance the point that Matthew made just now about the MLS? Because um, in a couple of months, he will be with Real Salt Lake looking for game mm -hmm. time and so on. Um, how do you feel about the MLS as a platform for Caribbean players to to embrace and ultimately develop their talent? I mean, it's, it's right next door. So we have to embrace it as a, as a serious opportunity. But as I said, there is a difference in how they experience football. Uh, you even see that at the youth level, college level, that there's unlimited substitutions most of the times, which allows for the game to be a lot more high stamina. You keep running, you keep going, and uh, we made some trips out there, and, and the football is in a different level. Now, as Matthew says, I think with more European influences coming in at that highest level, you're probably going to see, at least at MLS level, 
a bit more likewise football as we see in other parts of the world, which might make it better for our players to eventually maybe make that transition as well. So I think we can just hope to continue that European influence to see that in the MLS, um, because I think the majority of the players do want to, you know, at some point have that experience in Europe as well. Yeah. But it's a good point that you've just made because the influx of European stars, Lionel Messi the latest, and we're hearing Suarez going to Miami as well, but there was Ibrahimov Ibrahimovic mm -hmm. before and um, Wayne Rooney and... Um, um, and, and, and not just player level, but when you see on the coaching yeah. level, yeah. Um, you know, the organizational level, you see more and more American institutions, organizations choose for persons with European experience. So even from the structure side, I think in the future we're going to see more similar approaches um, in the MLS as what we've seen in Europe. Yeah, well, Eric just said it, Matthew, and uh, I'm not sure if you concur, but the MLS is a vehicle to advance your professional status as a, as a player. But do you, like Eric just suggested, have European ambitions as well? Um, not right now. I think I'm just focused on playing and getting to learn and grow as a player at Real Salt Lake. Um, maybe if opportunities come up based on how well a player will fit into their system, if something comes up, maybe if I consider it to be a good choice. But right now, it's just Real Salt Lake on my mind. Yeah, you know, the, the, the Jamaica Under-20 coach, John Wall, has kick-started the conversation about best route for development and transition into the professional ranks coming out of Jamaica specifically, but I guess on a wider scale, the Caribbean, because there are many similarities in how we operate across the Caribbean when it comes to football development. Transitioning from high school football in Jamaica slash the Caribbean to a U.S. college, um, NCAA football, into the MLS. Do you think that has been an underutilized route for our players? Um, I think we very much have to look at each individual player that we see at a certain level. Um, so I think it's part of us. Yes, development is, is key. But we have to put a lot more emphasis on creating opportunities than maybe other countries uh, and players from America or from Europe. Uh, and each player has a different situation, a different opportunity. And definitely the college route is one that I think a lot of players actually go through. I think we can put a lot more emphasis on creating those opportunities, especially when you look at the schoolboy level. Uh, I don't think anybody from Clarendon College, uh, from Glenmuir, from Kingston College should not go to college because you have that platform, you reach to the final, you lift trophies. Should we create a team to push them more in there? Uh, but what is the best opportunity? I think each player is, is have a look at where are you right now? Which opportunities do you get? Um, if a club from Europe calls and say we have an opportunity, are you really going to go college? You know? Uh, and maybe for some player, is, is the study route is not really a, a great one for that one. Uh, so look at individual players and what you can, but have that open mind that college, boarding school is one that you can also work. But, but there's a, a preparation aspect isn't there because if you're going to go the college route mm -hmm. you can't wait until it's your final well, year of high school I before you love make that, that you bring decision. It up. So uh, one thing that we really try to do um, and what we say to our more elite players at a higher level we we prepare for the European standard for the mm -hmm. professional standard because MLS is, is definitely at a higher level with it so we prepare for the professional standard but really our aim, the lowest level we want to go is college. Yeah. So while you reach your third form, fourth form, you start to show interest, which colleges would I like to go to, which subjects would I do, and in fourth form, fifth form, you have these applications out, you have footage ready, you send to college coach, coaches. Now maybe a college says, we, we would like you, if you get an opportunity in Europe, nothing wrong with calling the coach and say, sorry, but I got a better opportunity. Yes. But a lot of times we find ourselves not getting the European opportunity, or not the professional opportunity, yes and we don't have the preparation put in for college. So I think that is a crucial part we can do a lot better. Prepare for college while still aiming for as high as possible, but at least you have that route uh, ready for you in case it doesn't work out. I love the way you put that. By the way, Matthew, at what stage of your own development did you realize the options available to you, um, both from a US collegiate standpoint and a wider professional standpoint? So. Um like Coach Eric said, third form, fourth form, you know, I wanted to go to college and my parents always pushed me for college. And um, I think that middle step that I took at South Kent, 
that really helped me get into a top college for soccer in the U.S. And um, it's it's really just about like knowing what you want from early on and taking the necessary steps. Because you know, when I was in high school, footage wasn't that. It was hard to get videos and stuff. And um, so it was just it's just about knowing what you want. And, Not anymore. You know, thanks okay. to Sports Max, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. Not yeah. only that, you see more and more of, uh, video cameras going up, and, and yeah. I do mm -hmm. want to point it out. It's crucial. Not just that we film the matches, but yeah. that each player has himself or somebody to say, "Let us make a highlight video. Yeah. Let mm -hmm. us approach these coaches, get out the footage, because it's much easier for a coach to show interest um, via video than to book a ticket and come over here and watch it." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either of you can answer this question, and it, it, I guess it's a similar question but in a different way how much of your success to this point Matthew you would say was by design as opposed to just a stroke of luck I think it's God really God has blessed me with so many opportunities um, that a lot of people would be so grateful for and you know I'm, I praise God every day you know um, every time I speak about this or why I'm here you know, it's God just, just blessed me and I'm, I'm appreciative for it, you know. Eric? Yeah, it is, um, I mean, as a, as a coach or, you know, facilitator of this process, you, you often see a little bit more the luck element that maybe some of the players, because you like to believe you put in the hard work, you get the opportunity. Uh, but a lot of times it comes down to small little things as, can you get your visa? As simple as that. And sometimes you're unlucky, you don't get your visa. I remember when we just went to, to America, um, the first reaction from us everybody was, he's too short. <laughs> can, can be no, no forward that when you're so short. As I say, America, the game is a little different, a lot physical. Mm -hmm. Strikers yeah. and defenders, they're supposed to be big. Mm -hmm. um, and you really now have a little bit of luck that where we were with Vallejo, you have persons who had that other experience outside America. And I say, no, we can work with this guy because we see he's good. Um, so it's not just about being good. Mm -hmm. You have to have that luck element with it. But I do think that luck comes to those that actually keep putting in the work, yes. keep believing in themselves, yes. believing in the process. And a lot of times for those guys, things fall into place. And designing a way forward. But having an open mind. Yeah. Because I think at the stage where we went to America, I don't think that you were excited to go to another school for three years. Uh. Um, so, you know, I think at that time, even part of the mindset was mm -hmm. at this point, I think about 17, 18 at the time, can I go pro from here? Um, and then an opportunity comes to you that's maybe different than you thought, but as you say, at some point you have your, your end goal and the path, mm -hmm. you're not really sure, but once you keep focusing on that end goal, good things will happen for you. Yeah, sounds amazing. Matthew Bell, congratulations. You have done brilliantly to get to where you are and we wish you all the very best at Real Salt Lake. Um, we'll be watching the matches, all of them, and now we have more of a reason to watch the MLS Lance. Um, because yeah, but I want to say quickly before we end the segment though, but from the 90s when there are a lot of Caribbean players involved in the MLS, I was always keenly um, interested in monitoring the MLS because they have Caribbean players like Ezra Hendrickson from St. Vincent St. and the Grenadines, Grenadines, Jovin Jones from TNT, and now Kevin Molino have all been MLS champions from the, from the Caribbean. Yeah. And uh, there was a, a proliferation of, of Jamaicans as well, Andy Williams, Tyrone Marshall, Omar Cummings and so on. Cummings won uh, an MLS title as well. So yeah. there is a history of Caribbean players not only being prominent in the MLS, but being champions with the MLS. And we hope that Matthew will join that group. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> there, probably. All right. Sounds amazing. Let's go to a break on the Sportsman Zone. We're just chatting with Eric Rademakers and Matthew Bell. He's heading to Real Salt Lake in the MLS. Mm. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more. <laughs> 